While the Luftwaffe was gathering strength for its great leap into Russia, far to the east, the Japanese military air forces were preparing their own grand design. The growth of Japanese military aviation followed the general industrial growth pattern of the nation. Foreign technology was carefully copied, while an indigenous industry was established. The Japanese learned quickly. Starting in 1932, a series of aircraft design teams was established. These teams would create the aircraft that Japan would use to devastating effect in World War II. The Mitsubishi Type 96 bomber is an example of the success of the Japanese in producing original aircraft. In August 1937, the Japanese Navy used this modern twin-engined bomber to fly a 1,250-mile overwater flight to attack targets in China. This mission was beyond the capabilities of any other operational bomber in the world at the time. Like its Axis partner, Germany, Japan managed to catch the tide of aircraft modernization at exactly the right time. In a brilliant three-year period, from 1935 to 1938, Japan created the specifications for most of the aircraft it would use to take on the Western powers. The Japanese military had quite specific design goals for their aircraft. The Navy stressed maneuverability and long range in its fighters. Long range and bomb load were the important factors for the Navy's bombers. Speed was an important consideration, but was secondary to the other requirements. The Aichi D-3A dive bomber first flew in January 1938. Its allied code name was VAL. It was an all-metal, low-wing monoplane with an 840 horsepower radial engine. Its top speed was 240 miles an hour. It had a range of 915 miles. The VAL compared very favorably with America's equivalent aircraft the Douglas SBD Dauntless dive bomber. The Dauntless first flew on May 1st, 1940, more than two years later than the VAL. Both were pleasant to fly and easy to maintain. The Mitsubishi G4M1 Betty first flew on October 23rd, 1939. It was the medium bomber with which Japan went to war and in which the surrender parties would go to Iwo Jima. It was a handsome aircraft powered by two 1,500 horsepower radial engines. It had a top speed of 266 miles an hour and a phenomenal range of 3,256 miles. The North American B-25 Mitchell was an American counterpart to the G-4M. It was heavier, faster, and carried more bombs, but for shorter distances. With a 3,000-pound bomb load, it could reach only 1,500 miles. The Mitchell was much more heavily armed and armored than the Betty, and its range, although shorter, was adequate for the island-hopping style campaign it would take part in. The Mitsubishi A6M0 was by far the most famous Japanese fighter. It was built in greater quantities and served longer and more widely than any other Japanese warplane. The A6M2 that would attack Pearl Harbor had a top speed of 331 miles an hour. It weighed only 5,313 pounds fully loaded. Allied pilots were shocked by its agility. Early in the war, it was not uncommon for Japanese pilots to flaunt their skill by performing aerobatics during a dogfight. One of the Zero's most famous opponents early in the war was the P-40 Warhawk. The P-40 was heavier than the Zero, but slightly faster 
and much more stoutly built. Another was the Grumman F4F Wildcat. It was a little heavier than the Zero, just as fast, but not so maneuverable. It was tremendously strong. American pilots learned that it was suicidal to dogfight with the Zero. P-40 and Wildcat pilots developed tactics by which their heavy 50 caliber machine guns could chop the lighter A6M to pieces. Japan preferred the concept of relatively small, affordable air forces manned by the most expert crews available. The excellence of these crews was obtained at bitter human cost in training and in combat. All Japanese army training was based on a brutal, dehumanizing process. It turned recruits first into automatons and then into killers. They came to regard their enemies as racially inferior and therefore subject to any maltreatment, including mass murder. The training for Air Force programs was no less severe. It resulted in a very small, elite force of aggressive, superbly conditioned pilots. But there was a huge cost in wasted personnel and equipment. In pre-war years, the failure rate among trainee pilots was so high that it kept graduation numbers down to a few hundred annually. The system also inhibited individual initiative. This became a key factor later when the loss of a leader in a dogfight would throw a Japanese unit into confusion. Japan assumed that it could economize on air power because it would always control the scale of the fighting. Like Germany, it would learn to its sorrow that there is nothing more expensive than a second best air force. Japan only had two years of oil in reserve. It could not let its supplies fall below this level without seriously weakening its naval power. Japan decided to act. The German Vichy government in France had already allowed Japan to take over the French Empire in Indochina. Japan now wanted Siam, the Dutch East Indies, Burma, the Philippines and a string of islands extending from the Aleutians to the Solomons. This new empire would secure Japanese oil supplies. With its oil supplies safe, the Japanese fleet could defend the new empire until Great Britain and the United States were willing to negotiate a peace. The Japanese Navy was originally quite conservative. Its war games were based on luring the U.S. fleet to Japanese home waters and whittling down its strength by submarine action. The climax of these war games was a great fleet showdown in which the Japanese battleships would sink the enemy. In contrast, the Japanese army was radical. It demanded expansion in China, from 1937 on, it became increasingly involved with war against the Chinese. The power of the army was underlined when General Tojo Hideki became Prime Minister in October 1941. Gradually, the conservatism of the Navy was diluted by inter-service rivalry. The Navy came to want its own war, in which it would sail south to oust the European colonial powers from their holdings. But Admiral Yamamoto Isoroku, 
one of the greatest minds in the Japanese Navy, remained conservative. He was convinced that Japan could not win against the Anglo-Saxon powers. Yamamoto also believed that the time had come for Japanese leadership in Asia. After World War I, Yamamoto led a crusade to build carriers and procure the best in naval aircraft. He succeeded in getting approval for a separate fleet of aircraft carriers in addition to the traditional battle fleet. Yamamoto believed that if there must be a war, it should start with a surprise attack on the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. He saw to it that he was placed in command of this operation and began to gather the ships, the planes and the leaders with which to undertake it. He was not interested in invasion. He saw the US aircraft carriers, battleships and cruisers as the principal targets. With the American fleet destroyed, the flank of Japanese expansion in the southeast would be protected for a while. On November 26, 1941, the carrier task force sailed from Hitakapu Bay in the Kurils. The task force commander, Admiral Nagumo Chuichi, was totally inexperienced in air operations. He was opposed to the attack on Pearl Harbor. He was concerned that the Navy was throwing away 20 years of planning to risk everything on a single attack. But his pilots were eager. They were experienced with an extraordinary average of 800 hours flying time. There were 31 ships, six were aircraft carriers. There were two battleships and three cruisers. The rest of the fleet was made up of destroyers and tankers. This nation will remain a neutral nation, but I cannot ask that every American remain neutral in thought as well. In Washington, President Roosevelt and his advisors knew that war was probable. They expected the blow to fall on the Philippines and Malaya cannot be asked to close his mind or to close his conscience. The Japanese diplomatic code had been broken in the summer of 1940, but there was a time lag in deciphering the code and translating into English. There was an air of business as usual in the military establishment. In Hawaii, life was easy, especially on weekends. There was an overwhelming disbelief at all levels that Japan would attack Pearl Harbor. On the eve of the attack, Japan's primary target, the aircraft carriers Enterprise and Lexington, sailed, taking with them the muscle of the Navy's fighting force. The order to attack was given to the Japanese task force on December 7th. Admiral Nagumo maneuvered to the launch position 200 miles north of Oahu. At 0600 on December 7th, the Japanese first attack force of 183 aircraft began taking off. Thirty-nine fighters would stay with the carriers as defense. Forty-two fighters were assigned to secure air superiority and strafe targets of opportunity. There were 52 Aichi Val dive bombers. There were 89 Nakajima B-5N Kates. The Kate was by far the most advanced torpedo plane in the world at the time. It was a low-wing, all-metal monoplane, sleek and powerful looking, an aerial samurai sword. By 0645, the U.S. radar stations had all picked up targets just 135 miles from Oahu, heading south. The warnings were dismissed as U.S. aircraft returning or a flight of B-17s due in that morning. At Wheeler Field, the U.S. Army had drawn its aircraft into tidy rows 
to guard against sabotage. It was a fine target for the Val dive bombers. Kate torpedo planes bored in on battleship row from the east. Another wave of Kates came in from the west in a coordinated attack on battleships and cruisers. The Zero strafe targets of opportunity. Pandemonium on the ground turned into a wave of terror. A radio message went out. Air raid, Pearl Harbor. This is not a drill. The expected flight of B-17s also arrived. The Zeros moved in. They shot down one and badly damaged three. 49 level bombers came in, each with a single 1,700 pound bomb. They scored precise hits on the Arizona, West Virginia, Tennessee, California, and the Maryland. Dive bombers continued to attack hangars and other permanent facilities. Zeros concentrated on strafing parked aircraft. Only one zero was shot down by anti-aircraft fire. The American 47th Pursuit Squadron had not yet been hit. At 0815, five young lieutenants began a series of sorties that would last until 1000. They landed and refueled, taking whatever aircraft was ready to go, either Curtis P-40s or P-36s. The pilots had no problem finding the enemy. At 0850, the second attack force struck, flying down the east side of Oahu to curve in on the same targets. 78 VALs repeated the attacks on Ford Island ships and Pearl Harbor. The damage was catastrophic. Five battleships were sunk. Two of them were beyond hope of salvage, even in the shallow waters of Pearl Harbor. Three other battleships, three cruisers, and three destroyers were badly damaged. Casualties were very high. 2,403 were killed and 1,178 wounded. Japanese intelligence officers assessed their own damage. They lost 29 planes, five midget submarines, and one fleet submarine. Admiral Nagumo elected to withdraw, content with the damage he had done, unwilling to risk his fleet to a counter-attack. Tactically, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was a brilliant military maneuver. It was carefully planned and perfectly executed. It achieved all that could have been achieved, given that the American aircraft carriers were not in port. It also shielded the massive thrust being undertaken to the south. But in strategic terms, it was fatal to the Japanese empire. It embarked Japan upon a war it could never hope to win. In America, the attack transformed the country. It removed any indecision about entering the war. It silenced the isolationists and members of America First who wanted to keep the United States out of the war at any price. I say we must act. Now! Far away on the western edge of the Pacific, the Japanese prepared to launch another attack to coincide with the attack on Pearl Harbor. The attack assembling on the island of Formosa included a wide variety of aircraft types. Among them were G3M Nels, G4M Bettys, KI-21 Sallies, and Zero Fighters. <laughs> 
On the morning of December 8th, the Japanese took off to begin a series of attacks on the Philippines. Any one of these attacks should have jarred General Douglas MacArthur into an offensive response, but they did not. Formations of Japanese bombers and fighters arrived at Clark Field in the Philippines just as a huge assembly of American fighters and bombers was being refueled. The Japanese, who expected tough opposition, couldn't believe their luck. The attack went off as smoothly as Pearl Harbor. There was a day of hard and certain execution of air-to-air -air and air-to-ground fighting by the Japanese. At the end of it, the American Far Eastern Air Force had been gutted. 60 fighters had been destroyed. 12 B-17s had been destroyed and two damaged. Another 30 aircraft had been wiped out. American confidence was eroded as the Japanese delivered attacks on radar stations and communication centers. There were some individual American victories in the days that followed, but not enough to stem the Japanese. By December 16th, a decision was made to send the remaining B-17s to Australia for later use. On December 31st, most of the last of the American fighter pilots were evacuated. They had no planes to fly. The Japanese had achieved total air superiority, and their ground and naval forces moved accordingly. In the months leading up to the war, General MacArthur had announced that he would defend all of the Philippines crushing any invasion on the beaches. MacArthur commanded a nominal force of 120,000 troops. Most of them were untrained, ill-armed militia. But the Japanese landed 107,000 troops of their 14th Army at three different invasion points. The harsh reality of combat against unequal odds forced MacArthur to change his original defense plans. The American and Filipino forces dropped back to defend Bataan. Bataan is a 25-mile-long, 20-mile-wide peninsula. The island fortress of Corregidor was used as a base command post. MacArthur had pinned his hopes on an immediate American relief expedition. He had stockpiled the peninsula with food, ammunition, and hospitals sufficient for a six-month defense. There were more than 100,000 people crowded into the area. The peninsula was also a playground for malarial mosquitoes. Both armies were soon infected. The Japanese fared worse than the Americans. Their medical system was, and would remain, primitive. But the Japanese forces scored victory after victory. The defenders of Bataan held on until April 9, 1942. They were unaware that the Japanese forces facing them were almost exhausted and would not have been able to resist a counterattack. Sometimes Corregidor was hit by 16,000 shells a day. The fortress surrendered to an invasion force on May 6, 1942. General MacArthur had already been ordered to evacuate to Australia. His successor on Corregidor, General Jonathan Wainwright, was forced to order a general surrender throughout the Philippines. 30,000 American and 100,000 Filipino troops 
laid down their arms in the most bitter defeat in American history. British air opposition in Malaya was weak and quickly brushed aside. Japanese high-level bombers systematically attacked the fortress of Singapore. Dive bombers were brought in to quell any British counterattacks. There were ample British airfields on the Malay Peninsula, but few planes. Those that were there, except for a handful of hurricanes, were totally inadequate. The Japanese flowed down the Malay Peninsula, bypassing British roadblocks and using air power to overcome any genuine strong points. As they came, they gathered an aura of invincibility. On February 15, 1942, the 70,000-man garrison of Singapore surrendered. It was the greatest, most humiliating defeat in British history. It was a triumph of the greatest magnitude for the Japanese. They had put only 35,000 men into combat in the theater and had already lost almost a third of their force, killed or wounded. The rest of the Japanese thrust in Southeast Asia went the same way. Quick eradication of opposing air power, followed by a relentless push of ground forces. By May 20th, 1942, Japan had conquered the Philippines, Malaya, the Dutch East Indies, and Burma. They had seized Wake Island, Guam, and a host of smaller islands. 20 million square miles of territory had been added to the Japanese Empire. Yamamoto had indeed run wild, far faster than his most optimistic schedule. His country settled into a euphoria called by more sober Japanese, the victory disease. The effect was similar to the euphoric malaise that gripped the German conquerors after their victory in the West. Time was wasted, and leaders at every level began to focus on honors and celebrations rather than the next victory. During the first six months of 1942, the Allied air effort in the Pacific would be borne by two widely disparate elements. The first was carried out in China by Claire Chenault's famous Flying Tigers. The Flying Tigers was the popular title of the American Volunteer Group. It first entered combat on December 20th, 1941. It inflicted heavy losses on Japanese bombers attempting to bomb Kunming. The Tigers were equipped with obsolete Curtis P-40s. They were manned by volunteers released from active duty with regular U.S. forces. The group relied on Claire Chenault's tactics and a primitive but effective early warning system to defeat the Japanese. Chenault was the renegade champion of fighter aviation in the Army Air Corps. He had been thrust out of the service because he was too insistent on ideas running counter to the popular wisdom. He was wise in the ways of the Japanese. He trained his pilots always to use two plane elements in hit and run tactics. These tactics capitalized on the P-40's advantage in level flight speed and its vastly superior diving capability. The P-40's were strongly built. Their heavy firepower blew the fragile Japanese bombers into pieces 
Chenault and his men gave a boost to Allied morale at a time when there was nothing but bad news to be found on every front. On July 4th, 1942, the American volunteer group was disbanded. Many of its members were absorbed into the United States Army Air Forces. They had established a firm tradition of flying, fighting, and winning. On April 18th, 1942, a second element, very different from the Flying Tigers, made its mark on the war. It was led by Lieutenant Colonel James H. Doolittle. In a daring move that risked the invaluable aircraft carrier Hornet, Doolittle planned to use 16 modified North American B-25 Mitchells to strike against Japan. They had to cover 600 miles to strike targets in Kobe, Osaka, Nagoya, Tokyo, and Yokohama. Doolittle knew full well that it was only a token raid. Each B-25 carried only three 500-pound demolition bombs and one 500-pound incendiary cluster. The object was to shake Japan's morale and at the same time raise America's. The raid achieved total surprise. No B-25s were shot down, but all were lost. Fifteen crews had to bail out or crash land. One aircraft made it to Vladivostok where the Russians interned it and the crew. Three crew members were killed in crash landings. Another eight were captured by the Japanese and tortured and interrogated. Three of them were executed as examples. Doolittle knew he'd inflicted only minor damage he was convinced that he would be brought home and court-martialed for his failure. Instead, his achievement was recognized for the moral tonic that it was. He was given the Medal of Honor and promoted to Brigadier General. Jimmy Doolittle's attack had another unforeseen and far-reaching effect. It was obvious to the Japanese that the U.S. fleet was still a threat and must be destroyed. Yamamoto knew that aggressive action was necessary to keep the British and American fleets off balance. As a part of the overall thrust to the east, Yamamoto had decided to take Port Moresby in New Guinea as a base for an attack on Australia. He would take Tulagi in the Solomon Islands as a staging base for further operations. The British and the Americans were determined to contest the Japanese advance on Port Moresby. Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz was a quiet gentleman who drove himself hard. He sent his three admirals, Halsey, Spruance, and Fletcher, charging against Japanese island bases with the only weapon he had, the three carriers Enterprise, Lexington, and Yorktown. Both fleets played blind man's bluff, missing opportunities to strike. On May 5th, scout planes from both fleets located each other. The sightings were the opening jabs in what would become a slugfest between airplanes. It was a historic event, the world's first aircraft carrier battle in which no surface ship would see an enemy vessel. On May 7th, American aircraft, by chance, found the Japanese carrier Shoho. Douglas Dauntlesses and devastators from the Lexington and Yorktown attacked and sank it with bombs and torpedoes. An immortal radio call went out, one that was picked up immediately by the media and made a symbol of a new stage in the war. Lieutenant Commander Dixon exuberantly radioed, scratch one flat top, Dixon to carrier, Scratch one flat top. 
The Japanese counterattacked, launching 27 torpedo planes and level bombers. They ran into Admiral Fletcher's combat air patrol and in a dogfight lost seven planes compared with three for the Americans. The Japanese bombers jettisoned their loads into the sea, but they circled the carrier Yorktown amid a storm of anti-aircraft fire and radioed back her position. Fourteen of the surviving Japanese planes were lost at sea on their way back to their ship. The next day, both fleets were brought under observation by 0815. The Americans got off the first strike. By 0915, they had 75 aircraft in the air. SBDs and Devastators located two Japanese carriers. Nine of the Devastators dropped torpedoes. All nine malfunctioned. But the Dauntless dive bombers made it through the defenses to score three hits on the Shokaku, leaving it burning. By 1100, the Japanese had begun a devastating attack on the Yorktown. The Yorktown was blasted by an 800-pound bomb that penetrated four decks and killed or wounded 66 crew members. Two torpedoes penetrated Lexington's side. She started to list and couldn't maneuver. More torpedoes and bombs were delivered. In a brilliant show of damage control, the listing Lexington was righted by shifting oil ballast. Air operations were resumed. But as she crept back toward Pearl Harbor for repairs, a massive aviation fuel explosion gutted the ship. The Lexington's captain, Frederick C. Sherman, reluctantly gave the order to abandon ship. But the Lexington would not sink. The destroyer USS Phelps had to deliver the coup de grace with five torpedoes. The losses in the Battle of the Coral Sea on both sides were almost even, with a slight advantage going to the Japanese. But strategically, the Japanese thrust towards Port Moresby was stopped in its tracks. Yamamoto intended to force Nimitz to fight he would bring the U.S. Pacific Fleet to battle and destroy it. Midway, 1,300 miles northwest of Pearl Harbor, was bait for an elaborate trap. In all, there were 165 ships involved in Japan's complex plan and demanding timetable. The carrier striking force was to smash Midway Island's defenses and then defeat the American Pacific Fleet. In the meantime, the military occupation force was to seize Midway Island and convert it into a Japanese air base. Yamamoto commanded the largest fleet ever assembled in the Pacific, but he dispersed it so widely that its parts were vulnerable. The Japanese still believed that their codes were secure. They also believed that Nimitz had to be lured to fight. In fact, he was ready to let fly. Nimitz and his staff did not have complete information on the Japanese intentions, but they had enough to take immediate countermeasures. These included the reinforcement of Midway Island and the incredibly swift return of the repaired carrier Yorktown to combat. The Yorktown, the Enterprise, and the Hornet would make up the carrier striking force. On board, the carriers were 77 Grumman F-4Fs, 112 Douglas SBDs, and 42 Douglas Devastators. In addition to the carriers, the Pacific Fleet included six cruisers, nine destroyers, and 19 submarines. The strength of the Japanese fleet was estimated at four battleships, five carriers, nine heavy cruisers, five light cruisers, 24 destroyers, and 25 submarines. In spite of Japan's advantage in numbers, Nimitz counted on both tactical and strategic advantages. He controlled Midway. Midway was not only unsinkable, 
it was also a magnet for Japanese bombs diverting them from the Pacific Fleet. Midway had a powerful air force. There were 32 PBY patrol flying boats. By June 4th, Nimitz had 105 aircraft on Midway with 141 officers and 2,886 men. He now positioned his carriers just out of range of expected Japanese reconnaissance and waited. At the same time, American Task Force 17 was steaming southwest. It arrived at a point 202 miles north of Midway, within striking distance of the Japanese fleet. It was ready to launch at 0430. The Japanese Admiral Nagumo was unaware of the presence of the American ships. He struck first at Midway with a force of 108 airplanes, 72 kates and 36 vowels. Unknown to the Japanese, a consolidated PBY had spotted two of the carriers and radioed their position to Midway. Aircraft erupted from the Midway runway, some to save themselves from attack, others to defend the island. At Midway, the Japanese bombers destroyed some buildings and oil tanks, but it was not decisive. A second attack would be necessary. The B-17s from Midway joined the battle. They dropped bombs from 20,000 feet. The hits they claimed were later discounted. A Japanese reconnaissance aircraft located the fleet at 0728, but didn't indicate in its message that a carrier was present. At 0925, Lieutenant Wade McCluskey was leading a patrol of Douglas Dauntlesses on a disappointing search. He had reached the spot where the Japanese fleet was supposed to be, only to find empty sea. His fuel was low, but he decided to continue on the same heading for 10 minutes. Then, without authorization, he turned right to the northwest. 20 minutes later, he saw the Japanese destroyer Arashi steaming toward the Japanese fleet. The patrol was almost out of fuel. McCluskey knew that any of his aircraft that survived an attack on the Japanese fleet would have to ditch in the sea. He did not hesitate. He turned to follow the destroyer. There were ineffective attacks on the fleet by SBD Dauntlesses and Vought Vindicators from Midway. Eight SBDs were lost to the deadly Zeros. Neither the Dauntlesses or the Vindicators did much damage, but they kept the Japanese carriers twisting and turning. Another U.S. attack was on the way. 117 aircraft, Dauntlesses, Devastators and Wildcats from the carriers Enterprise and Hornet. It was a desperate mission, almost at the limit of the aircraft's combat radius. At 0917, Admiral Nagumo turned to launch a strike against the American fleet. His decks were littered with aircraft changing armament and refueling. At 0925, eight Douglas Devastators, without fighter escort, attacked the Soyuz. They flew into a whirlwind of anti-aircraft fire and zero bullets. Only one plane got close enough to launch its torpedo, with no effect. Five minutes later, another 14 Devastators attacked. Ten were shot down. Still, there was no damage to the Japanese. But the American aircraft forced the Japanese ships to maneuver to avoid them. No fighters could be launched. Meanwhile, at 10.01, Wade McCluskey sighted the Japanese carriers. He reported the position of the enemy fleet to the Enterprise, and then he and the other Dauntlesses dove to attack. 
On the bridge of the Akangi, Admiral Nagumo looked up to see his worst nightmare, a waterfall of American planes diving in from 15,000 feet, spaced five seconds apart. Explosions sent a raging fire storming through the Kara. It sank with 800 men trapped below decks. More Dauntlesses arrived from the carrier Yorktown. Their target was the carrier Soryu. They placed three 1,000-pound bombs evenly along the deck. Admiral Yamaguchi Tamon launched a counterattack against the American carrier Yorktown. Seven bells from Yamaguchi's carrier Hiryu got through the Yorktown's defenses. Direct hits from three left the Yorktown dead in the water, burning fiercely. A second attack followed up. Two torpedoes hit the Yorktown. Her rudder was jammed and she was listing badly. But just as that attack was occurring, a patrol from the Enterprise sighted the Hiryu. 25 dive bombers were dispatched to attack. Within 30 minutes, another 16 were on their way. The first bombs missed, but three from the last few dive bombers penetrated her deck. At 0255 on June 5th, Admiral Yamamoto gave the order for his fleet to withdraw. To his officers, he said, I'll apologize to the Emperor myself. Yamamoto knew that the first naval defeat in 350 years had turned the tide against his homeland. In a period of just a few minutes, a handful of obsolete Douglas dive bombers had sunk four aircraft carriers. They had won the Battle of Midway. They reversed the course of the Pacific War. They destroyed the best of Japan's naval aviators. They brought an almost hysterical wave of enthusiasm to the United States, which gave new impetus and energy to the American war effort. 